Hello to everybody and uh, welcome to once more this uh, webinar uh, organized uh, by FAO within the series of knowledge uh, dissemination dialogue on AMR. Thank you all of you for joining. Uh, I see from the list there that uh, many from many of you, many of you, it's very early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Uh, many uh, participants uh, from uh, other from the Americans are from Asia. So thanks again for joining despite uh, not being a very good uh, time. So this, as I was saying, has become almost a traditional appointment and uh, a monthly appointment for the time being. And I'm, I'm happy to inform you that uh, uh, already for this month's uh, the appointment is doubling. And from now on, we are going to have a webinar twice per month the first Thursday and the last, the fourth uh, Tuesday of, uh, the, of the month, just uh, to give uh, the possibility to many of you who have contacted us uh, to, to be able to share uh, your valuable experience and uh, get being in contact with many other colleagues uh, all over the world. Uh, so this webinar is organized by the FAO uh, Working Group on Antimicrobial Assistance, together with the FAO Sustainable Livestock Technical Network, I don't want to take uh, any more time because we have a very interesting presentation ahead, ahead of us on the research results and strategies to reduce the use of antimicrobials in the Canadian poultry sector. And we're going to hear also about the impact uh, we have uh, with us, uh, who is going to share with us our incredibly valuable experience, Professor Martin Bullian, who is the Chair of Poultry Research of uh, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine of the University of Montreal, Canada. So now, uh, Marina, the next slide, please. Just, uh, I think all of you are very used already to, to participate in webinars, but just uh, a few reminders. Keep your microphone mute. If you can rename yourself, just adding, for instance, the country you're coming from or your organization, so you have uh, an idea of where you are participating from, just note that uh, Professor Bullian uh, views are around and not the one of FAO. Uh, please, uh, in the chat, you will have, uh, you will, we will hear for half an hour to a presentation, and then you will have half an hour to post your questions. So please uh, uh, write on the chat box and we will address them after, you know, the second part of the webinar. But please refrain from advertising any service or your company any commercial product and so on. That's very important for us. And this presentation, this webinar will be recorded. So after uh, we will receive the recording of the webinar and also the presentation together with also some other advice on further reading. So don't worry about uh, uh, taking notes so you can concentrate on uh, hearing Professor Bullian. And I think it's all for now. So I will give the floor to Professor Bullian. Thank you again for joining us, despite him being early in the morning for her, who's based in Canada. So uh, Martin, floor to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Daniela, for the invitation. I very much appreciate the opportunity to share with the audience our research results and the strategies on antimicrobial use reduction in Canadian poultry and their impact as well. So uh, briefly, I'll um, um, draw a quick Canadian portrait, um, then describe what the chair is, what we do in terms of research, and we'll describe in terms of um, historically, what has happened uh, on AMR and EMU surveillance programs, both at this um, governmental and uh, the producer levels. So um, we have a, we're located, as you know, Canada is, in, um, loca is located in North America, and we are a federation that is divided in um, 10 provinces and three territories. So you can already see that in terms of um, it, this has in terms of legislation some issues. For example, when it comes to um, drug licensing or antimicrobial use, basically it is a federal government will do the drug licensing, and the provinces will do the drug use regulation. So you'll see differences between provinces in terms of veterinary prescription as well as access to medication. You might see now it's more uniform, but it used to be more different. 
The structure of the poultry industry is based on the producer. More than 90% of our Canadian chicken farmers are family owned and operated. There's no or very little vertical uh, integration. And um, also what makes this poultry system unique in Canada that is it is managed by a supply management system, which was created in the 70s. So that means that the producers must pay to have the right to produce. They must acquire quota and the price paid to the producer on the other end is based on production costs. So there's no losses and the production is usually predicted according to consumption. So in terms of, of course, this has to be managed and usually at the heart of the national management supply system, you'll find the chicken farmers of Canada with also the various provincial um, organization or uh, producer association that are responsible for either the interprovincial trade at the level of chicken farmers of Canada or intra-provincial trades at the level of the um, provincial poultry farmers. So it seems to be a bit complex, but it makes for um, a simplification of the structure. When there's a problem, we have a single body where to refer to, i.e. the chicken farmers of Canada, nationally speaking, I mean. In terms of statistics, the Canadians are big chicken uh, big chicken eaters. In uh, 2021, we were eating 35.8 kilos. We've produced 1.3 billion kilos of eviscerated mm -hmm. weight in the same year and contributed to the uh, Canadian uh, gross domestic product, the GPD, uh, by an amount of $8 billion. In Canada, when you grow chickens, basically you reach to you plan to reach a weight of 2.5, 2.3, 2.2, 2.3 kilos, sorry, in 35 days. So your chickens are going to be fed through different diets that all will have antimicrobials to prevent certain diseases, mostly necrotic enteritis, and antacoxidials to prevent coccidiosis. And this is what we call the conventional prevention programs. And it used to be also that we were using antimicrobials at the hatchery. But you'll see that there's been some changes regarding the type of antimicrobials uh, that uh, we're using in the coming minutes. Um, the chair that I'm holding has been established in 1999 and was founded by the uh, various five uh, feather federations or association uh, associations in the province of Quebec. And basically, I like to say that uh, the chair has addressed in the past years uh, societal changes in consumers' requests, such as a decrease of antimicrobial use in animal production. And more recently, alternative housing to conventional cages and layers and the effect that this has had on uh, basically the laying hands. In terms of antimicrobial stewardship, we are working on trying to reduce the use of antimicrobials, even to eliminate it, by searching also various alternatives to antimicrobials. So back to the core of our story, history of um, AMR and AMU surveillance programs in Canada. Well, as you all probably remember, in, two, in 2001, AH, the World Health Organization had a strategy to curb antimicrobials and antimicro sorry, antimicrobial resistance. And in Canada, the uh, um, uh, Health Canada, which is the, uh, the agency uh, for human health, basically ask an adversary committee to um, have a, to report regarding the uses of antimicrobials in food animals in Canada and their resistance on um, and their impact on resistance in human health. So that report came, or that group um, came up with a series of recommendations in a lengthy report that recommended, for example, integrated approach through Health Canada to develop a coordinated and going national surveillance systems for antimicrobial resistance and major pathogens pathogens affecting food animals. And also they had different recommendations regarding antimicrobial regulation, the fact that we needed to have a compulsory vet prescription, implementation of the Kenyan Veterinary Medical Association prudent use principles, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in parallel, CPARS, which is the um, Canadian Integrating Program on Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance, uh, was 
making its first steps. And um, although we had surveillance infrastructure for diseased animals and, and humans, there was no existing sample collecting system for abattoirs, retail, and farms to build upon. So this is why we knew that there was it was essential to have active surveillance to successfully collect data in Canada. So um, this is why we uh, CPARS uh, basically that's its main objective was to provide an integrated approach uh, to monitor the trends in antimicrobial resistance in any in both humans and animals, and uh, that was to build on a database that would help uh, us better understand the emergence and the spread of uh, resistant bacteria and to facilitate also the um, uh, the assessment of the effect, the impact on public health, as well as to support the creation of what we wanted was evidence-based policies to control AMUs. So um, this is basically how CPARS uh, was created. We had samples from the human population going to uh, a national laboratory. And uh, we also had of course, already established a system where we were looking at the pathogens from exic animals. But what uh, CPARS did was to establish a retail system, um, a collection at the retail level. And then they were doing the data integration. So the first annual report was uh, published in 2002. Um, and that was a first step. And uh, parallel again in 2003, Health Canada did publish a classification system for antimicrobial. Um, and basically the categorization that is used in Canada is different than in other uh, countries. It's quite unique. It goes from category, very high importance in human medicine from one to four, which is low importance that are drugs basically not used in human medicine. And uh, of course, one, two, and three are considered, considered to be important in human medicines from very high to medium importance. These are some examples of the drugs that are meeting those criteria. And uh, you'll find in the very high importance, the um, cephalosporin, and I'll come back to ceftiofur. And in the category two, you'll find other antimicrobials that are frequently used in prevention programs in poultry, such as uh, virginomycin, for example, used to be, I should say, or basitracin, that is a class three. And of course, you have your ionophores the, uh, that are anticoxidials. What is not categorized are the chemical coccidiostats as well as avelomycin, uh, which is an orthomycin that hasn't been categorized yet by Health Canada. And these are basically drugs that uh, have been um, labeled in Canada for use in poultry. So what happened very shortly after the first year of existence of CPARS was that in 2000 Three in 2004, well, mostly in 2004, CPARS reported the emergence of a septiofer resistant salmonella Hallerberg in both retail chickens and humans. This was observed, as you see here on the graph, mostly in the province of Quebec. And um, the we had various discussions with the industry and the government. I was part of these discussions, and we were the uh, Quebec hatcheries decided to voluntarily withdraw the use of ceftiofur at the hatchery, which was usually done in a uh, subcutaneous injection at the day of age. And um, at that time, also gentamicin was another drug used, but it had been um, not available for uh, a long period. So this is why the hatcheries were relying mostly on ceftiofur, and they decided in February 2005 to stop using this. And unfortunately, because of some problems in the field, early mortality and so on, there was a partial reinstitution of safety use in 2007, but in rotation with another drug, which was nicomycin spectinomycin. So here, and this is a publication that was key in showing basically a uh, direct relationship between the use of uh, antimicrobials in uh, food animals and its direct impact on public health and resistance in humans. 
So you see here in 2005, the with voluntary withdrawal of safety offer at the hatchery and the impact it had on the incidence of Salmonella Alderberg resistant, safety offer resistance strain. So we see a decrease and is followed by a short increase once there was a uh, partial reinstitution of safety offer use. And in parallel, you see also the same effect on E. coli in the, in the um, retail chickens. So following this, at that time, well, at that time also at the Chair and Poultry Research, we did a one-year observational study um, and we looked at a, if there was a, a correlation between AMR and MU in chickens, in turkeys. So we found that there was a, a lot of, res, uh, well, some strains um, of Enterococcus were resistant to as many as 11 antimicrobials in chickens, a bit less in turkeys, but also significant associations between AMU and AMR for both Enterococcus sicorum and E. coli. In E. coli, we saw that the use of septiofer was indeed uh, associated with the resistance in uh, E. coli. So at that time, uh, the chicken farmers of Canada in 2011 did an internal study in the antimicrobial use, their own audit, while CPARs started also their on-farm antimicrobial use surveillance system, which consisted basically in sampling across the various provinces with the support of various veterinarians, a uh, number of broader um, and turkey flux, and nowadays layer flux as well. Um, and then they can basically look at the amount of antimicrobials that are used. We also did at that time a one field trial at the chair and poultry research on antibiotic free chickens. Basically, we followed over a year period eight farms with two similar barns uh, to match uh, the management, the feed, the, the chicks. And what we found is that even with um, alternative uh, preventive means, we had 25% of the flocks that were affected with necrotic enteritis caused by Clostridium perfringens. And we showed that Clostridium perfringens can persist in consecutive flocks, um, and the same strain will persist based, and that was based on PFGE. We also looked at the importance of coccidia, having a good coccidia prevention to um, prevent necrotic enteritis. And we worked on the, the importance of optimal brooding and developed with the industry a um, basically a fact sheet to help the producers to optimize their brooding period. However, in 2011, the chickens became a problem to the public. In fact, uh, we have a um, program in English Canada that is called Marketplace um, that likes to be uh, to uh, dig some facts that um, can uh, raise the interest of people, if I can say that. So what they had, they um, what they had was basically they went to the market, supermarket, collected chickens, and then went to a laboratory, and uh, they came up with the results showing that 90 bacteria, is, that they, out of uh, their samples, they tested 100 samples with 90 bacteria find, found and 60 resistance to at least one antibiotic. There was probably some problems in terms of the scientific procedures, but nonetheless, for to the general public, this um, created a sense of insecurity uh, in, uh, when it came to broiler chickens and the chicken farmers of Canada uh, reacted in uh, launching a voluntary strategies regarding antimicrobial use in 2012. So the first step consisted in 2014 to stop using well, to stop the preventive use of category one antimicrobials, i.e. fluoroquinolones and cephalosporin, and in the end of 2018, to stop the use of category two. But they were also planning on stopping the use of the preventive use of category three antibiotics, such as bacitracin. Uh, at the end, uh, well, this is now to be determined with the pandemic. We had some delay, let's say that. So um, we helped the industry in doing another field trial and uh, looking also at the effect of the safety offer withdrawal. So a year after the withdrawal, we had 
we came up with some interesting results at the Turin Poultry Research. We sampled in 2014 and 2015 breeders, hatchery, and broiler flocks, receiving safety offer in 2014 and uh, lincospectin or no antimicrobials in 2015. And we show indeed that the withdrawal of in, in, in novo safety offer administration led to the reduction of the prevalence of resistance gene in the meconium, genes resistant to safety offer. And as well as, but however, we found that replacing safety affair with lincospectin was not the answer since we observed a development of multi resistant strain uh, of uh, E. coli resistant to as many as eight to nine different antimicrobials. So uh, when it came to the field trial, we had to help the producer realize that they could produce chickens with no antibiotics, category one, two and uh, in three. So basically we did a year study again uh, on different farms in pair barns, and we wanted to look at the impact on performances and intestinal health, as well as sickle microbial um, composition. And uh, the treatment consisted in basically uh, administering the birds strictly ionophores with or without organic acids in the feed, the butyrate. And the conventionally raised chickens were compared to these flocks. We showed that there was no, basically, if you look at the various zootechnical parameters here, there was no impact of using ionophores or ionophores plus butyrate over a year period, and no difference with the different with the uh, conventionally raised chickens. And surprisingly, when we looked at the microbiota of the chickens, the sequel microbiota at age of slaughter, at 35, around 35 days of age, we observed that the main driver for that microbiota composition was the flock in the farm. It wasn't at the time of slaughter, the antimicrobials program, which was very surprising to us. So in uh, this, knowing this, our producers feel reassured and well-equipped to face the uh, second withdrawal uh, of uh, category two, preventive use of category two antimicrobials. And we, uh, however, since then, what we've seen uh, when we are talking about um, consequences is an increased early mortality, which happened basically mostly, um, I would say, in the first year after with the withdrawal. And then um, slowly people, uh, the producers, the, not the producers, sorry, the hatcheries and the breeders uh, worked on improving the egg sanitation, the egg quality, the chick quality, and that mortality, even if it's slightly higher to what it used to be with antimicrobials use at the hatchery, is now um, it is now uh, I would say fairly good. Uh, producers, it used to be that 0.8 percent was what was considered to be normal in a first 10 days. Now we see more 1, 1.2%, and we consider it to be a problem when it's 1.5%. Uh, However, we've seen the emergence of an enterococcal spondylitis and osteomyelitis. Uh, this first came in Canada in 2008, and uh, we've seen the numbers increasing to the point that enterococcal sacrum infection is um, almost as frequent as colibacillosis in certain provinces, not all of them. It seems that it's a problem mostly affecting uh, Eastern provinces. And we also see that enterococcus sacrum is a multi-resistant bacteria. Uh, and that has led this emergence of enterococcal spondylitis and somalitis to an increased use of category two antibiotics in some provinces. Um, and uh, that is definitely something we have to uh, work on. And we're investigating at the Chen Poultry Research uh, more closely enterococcus sicorum. So in essence, since CPARS, since its establishment, has been able to capture the human and animal data before and after the voluntary withdrawal uh, by the industry, and to see also the impact it has had on the public health. So uh, this is basically here in uh, a graph uh, showing uh, basically the uh, correlation between the retail chicken in blue 
and then at slaughter that you see that those those are two closely uh, closely related, but mostly the human cases in gray. Um, so what we see is the industry wide band um, on the preventive use of category one antimicrobial safety of fear and the impact it has had in 2014. So a decrease in um, uh, basically in the number of cases. So also the surveillance system uh, from CPAR, both AMU and AMR, has shown that AMU has decreased since 2016. This is what uh, we expected, as well as, interestingly, the resistance to um, uh, three or more antimicrobial classes for Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter. They also have observed a diversity, uh, a decrease in the diversity of antimicrobial classes reported to be used. And this is this has been consisted, of course, with the timing of the elimination of the preventative, preventative uses of category two antimicrobials, as you can see here in this table. So overall, we have here, and this was a very brief uh, and rapid picture that I drew of the Canadian situation but we have here changes to the antimicrobial use that was that were brought uh, by um, the uh, by an industry by the chicken industry and not only chicken the poultry industry because turkeys and uh, this also I um, basically focused my talk on chickens but the turkey industry did exactly exactly the same so we then have an example as I was mentioning of a con of um, poultry producers that have decided to um, uh, looking at the numbers and the, the data um, that CPARs show them um, that uh, they had to change their way of growing their chickens. And this is something that is very nice also with the CPARs and I have to congratulate my, um, uh, my colleagues at uh, that uh, agency, but CPARs has always been very open and transparent with their results in sharing and discussing and bringing a further understanding to the various stakeholders. Um, and I can only speak for the poultry industry, but I'm sure they've done the same also with the swine and the dairy industry. So in closing, I would like to acknowledge the work of our first Canadian veterinary epidemiologist who developed CPARS, uh, to Dr. Rebecca Irwin and Lucy Dutil for their leadership. And also I'd like to thank Dr. Agnes Agunos, um, who's been helpful in helping me with the presentation with her contagious smile and generous support. And I'd like also to acknowledge the work of all the Canadian poultry producers that have taken up that uh, such a challenge because this is not an easy task and they knew they had to uh, do it. And the Chicken Farmers of Canada was uh, exemplary in uh, consulting with the various stakeholders in providing educational material to their producers and supporting research as well. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank the staff and the students from the chair in poultry research, we, who have been quite numerous in the past, uh, and well, since the established establishment of the chair. And on this, I guess that uh, I my time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. It has been a fascinating overview through the history and how Canada and the, the poultry sector has managed the, not only to reduce the use of antimicrobials, but what is uh, very interesting and promising because that's happened also in other countries, especially to reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance. So I think it gives a lot of hope and a lot of uh, push to all of us uh, to keep on working in uh, reducing uh, the use of uh, antimicrobials. So, and I see uh, there are already questions coming up. So uh, I will invite you to address the first one by Yusuf Ibrahim, uh, who is asking why was uh, safety fuel uh, reintroduced in, in 2007? 
it was because of the uh, increased early mortality. And uh, because this is not a vertical integrated system, production system, the producers are buying their chicks from the hatcheries. And uh, there were many complaints that the hatcheries had to deal with. So uh, they stopped using septiofur for a while. Then they started using lancospectin and thinking that it would be better to start rotating products um, and knowing the um, long withdrawal period of gentamicin, they opted to um, use septiofur, but on a rotation basis. And that was basically to counteract the uh, early mortality that were omphalitis that we were seeing. So we have another question by Eugenie Bai, who was asking why uh, Canada is using a different kind of, kind of categorization of antimicrobials, I mean, different from the rest of the world. That is an excellent question, um, and we would have to ask someone from the public health agency. But from uh, uh, from a user point of view, when I looked at the various categorization that they have done, I think it's it it is a, a good representation of what is important and what is less important in, in terms of discrimination. And for the veterinarians, it gives us more chance in our, our more tools in our toolbox. If you want to decrease the use of what is really important in human medicine, then we have to be left with some tools. And that probably gives us this uh, possibility. Thank you. And now I will take the, the, the liberty of uh, sharing to pose a question myself. You're showing a very good as a collaboration between the governmental authorities and the private sector. What do you think is the secret for that good collaboration, for that good exchange of information? And, uh, you know, what would you advise to other countries or to other uh, people? Um, I. I guess communication and uh, everything was science-based, evidence-based. And this is what was uh, very, and it becomes then very easy to show the evidence and to discuss what needs to be uh, changed. And this is what, that was a, a strength of CPARS to be evidence-based from the very beginning and uh, deciding that we need to collect data before imposing anything and then open the discussion. So, and bringing everyone around the table, because of course I was talking, CPARS is a federal organization, but you also had to gather around the table the various provinces as well. So um, you, they have to deal with different organizations, with governmental agencies, as well as uh, producer associations. Thank you. And uh, by the way, I would like to ask, uh, our former colleague and now uh, Martin colleague, colleague Agnes Segundo, who is sharing a very interesting uh, document in the, in the chat. So thanks a lot, Agnes. And uh, we will collect also, if you want, you can share other interesting resources and documents. We will collect those and then also share at the end of the webinar uh, with the registration of the, the recording of the webinar itself and the Martin Bullian presentation. So thanks for contributing also in the chat. And if anybody else would like to further contribute and share interesting resources or links to publication, please do so. They're always very useful. And we have an additional question by Eugene Libai, uh, who is asking if the higher immortality before the antimicrobial ban could be because of poor biosecurity and uh, the quality of uh, the, the, the chicken so on. Is it a possibility? Well, um, we've had various scares with avian influenza in the past decades, and that has markedly uh, improve the biosecurity measures in uh, in Canada in Canadian poultry farms. So we knew that the biosecurity measures were well somehow good, but compliance is not always. Um, so that is one point. But most of the problem related to early mortality is, as uh, Eugene mentioned. Um, the quality of eggs. So this is why 
um, it's very important to work on hygiene and egg sanitation, uh, both at the breeder flock level and at the hatchery level. And of course, hatching eggs is an art and um, it, it requires uh, the most important, well, it, attention to details, but it goes back to um, egg quality, egg sanitation in order to obtain a quality of chick. And also, also this is why also we put, we wanted to uh, equip uh, the producers with a, a tool to uh, help them in um, optimizing the brooding, because I do think that the brooding period is extremely important as well. And we want to make sure that we have a chicks that will be in a comfort zone, have access to feed and water uh, as quickly and early as possible to be able to develop its immune system. Um, so this is why we've developed um, a fact sheet and videos also that are available online to help our producers in asset in evaluating and assessing the, their own brooding with a few tricks and recommendations. We have a question by Ibrahim Lo who is asking who owns the exclusive rights on the possession and distribution of antimicrobials, especially antibiotics for veterinary use in Canada, of course. Well, that is an interesting question. The way that it, uh, I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm, I hope that I understand well the question, but um, the it is now uh, by law a an obligation to have a veterinary prescription to administer antimicrobials to the feed, the water, or various means of administration to food animals. Uh, there's no over-the-counter type of medication. And um, the only people legally who can, or the only professions who can sell drugs are pharmacists, pharmacies, or veterinarians. So you have basically the, um, uh, the, the companies who will be selling their products to uh, pharmacists or to veterinarians to be used in food animals. Thanks, and I think we have uh, partially already replied to this question, uh, also by Eugenie Bai, uh, um, who assumed that the uh, antimicrobial ban is for metaphylaxis and prophylaxis, if you consider also those added in feed, so the medicated feed. The medicated, the ban indeed is for the preventative, preventative use. If you have sick birds, you can use a um, a category two antimicrobial in the feed or in the water if you have a sick bird. Um, the a problem is with Enterococcus echorum, oftentimes when we see sick birds, it's already too late to treat. So a practice that we've seen and we're trying to, and this is something that we're trying to curb at the current moment, is the use of metaphylactic um, penicillin, for example, or amoxicillin in the feed in chicks uh, for the first uh, 10 days, for example, in order to decrease the load of enterococcus infection or uh, pressure, if I can say that. This is a practice that, um, well, we don't know what are the risk factors that are associated with um, enterococcal spondylitis and osteomyelitis. And this is something that we'll be working on. And I often tell my students that in order to um, fight against your enemy, you, know, you need to know it well. And uh, you know you need to understand how the disease develop, um, how it how it's been transmitted. So at the churn poultry research, we've developed uh, PCR and qPCRs to identify commensal and pathogenic isochorum strains based on um, um, some scientific uh, data. And uh, we see a lot of enterococcus sicorum commensal strains out there, but also, um, many pathogenic ones. It seems to be a very, um, there's a lot of plasticity in the genome of that bacteria as well. Um, and I'm not too sure how we'll be able to uh, find, develop a vaccine anytime soon, but we definitely need to 
um, better understand how it happens. We know that there's an early infection, but we don't know what are the risk factors. But once we under, better understand the risk factors, we'll be able to really um, put in place the measures to curb that, uh, that problem. But in the meantime, we're working a lot on hygiene, uh, cleaning, disinfection, disinfecting uh, not only the barns, but also the water lines. Um, and we also, that's something I forgot to mention, um, we start on fresh litter every time. We don't use build-up litter like in the States. So that's a good start for our chicks as well. Um, but again, we need more research with that bacteria to better understand and decrease the use of uh, the current use of antimicrobials we've seen. We've seen an increase definitely in the last few years because of that disease. So thank you. Another question by Yusuf Ibrahim. Are there alternatives that the Canadian poultry farmers use to reduce antibiotics, uh, to, to reduce uh, the use of antibiotics? Yes, they are numerous alternatives that are available to the poultry producers. Um, I, a, a, num a number of uh, companies have developed products that, that are mainly consisting of um, herbs like uh, herbs, for example, or uh, organic acids or essential oil. So what you see in other countries, we also have in Canada. Um, they are, it, it, it it used to be, and that is a, I, I didn't mention that it is the federal who does the licensing of the drugs. And um, there is there, there was a problem regarding the licensing of these products because they are not replacements to antibiotics. They are not as effective. Uh, and you have to use them very early on if you see something. Um, and you need to be very, uh, working without antibiotics, but without in with alternative is like working without a safety net, basically. And um, so, yes, these products are available. Some of them are more efficient than others. And we have tested many of them in our lab uh, in vitro. And we do see it. But the difference in like it's going from in vitro to in vivo that is interesting uh, and there's uh, so many challenges on the farm as well uh, and the delivery mode also is important so yes we do have these products and what is interesting also is that we might have also some uh, phages um, there's a company in Quebec that has been working on trying they, they brought their first phage product to um, the regulatory body. So it will be interesting to see how it goes. Um, but yes, we do have various products that are available. We've tested, and as I mentioned, we um, have tested a few. Um, and of course, organic acids, like what you see in other countries that um, is, it's the same here. Thanks, Martin. And uh, with respect to this particular topic, I would like to take this opportunity to inform everybody that uh, Martina, uh, together with other experts, participated in the meeting FAO organized uh, beginning of July, exactly to address uh, what are the alternatives that could be used in the animal nutrition field, uh, the, the different alternatives, uh, different strategies to help uh, uh, to reduce the use of antimicrobials. So the report of that meeting is in preparation. It will come up as a FAO publication in the coming month. So keep tuned because you will all be informed and I think you will find out, you will find interesting information there, elaborating even more on what the Professor William was saying. And now let's go to next question. I think very interesting also by Naomi Peter from Ilri in Kenya was asking if the farmers were receptive to reducing the use of antibiotics, uh, um, what they were doing. I think it brings the component of behavioral changes. And I think it's another interesting topic to address. So to you, Martin. Yes. Um, well, of course, there's always resistance to the change. Um, and the as I mentioned, the chicken farmers of Canada were excellent in developing a good communication program. Um, and they first started by uh, obtaining data from uh, CPARs, uh, realizing that there was a problem. And it's probably because uh, part of it is probably due to the fact that the chicken is short-lived. And uh, But we were the commodity with the uh, 
more important prevalence of resistance to various antimicrobials for the various food pathogens that CPARS was uh, looking at. So um, that was easy to, to see. They had their own internal um, study to look at the uh, what was the use and also the perception of their producers regarding who does the prescription, who does decide for the drugs. And uh, so th that, that was also interesting. And um, then they consulted the various stakeholders, the Hatcheries Association, the Processor Association, the various veterinary groups uh, in the, the country. And we had numerous of these round tables and sessions where we were discussing the pros and cons and the risks. Um, and eventually they uh, came up with a very structured plan, step by step, as you've seen, but also they came up with a numerous tools to support their producers in the transition. They develop videos, they develop booklets uh, regarding the ex uh, explaining their strategy, explaining antimicrobial resistance, the risk to public health uh, and to, um, uh, and uh, also not only the risk to public health, but also in, in terms of, um, how the producers, what were the tools for them to improve their uh, their life, basically, or their chicken um, uh, quality of uh, or the chicken's health with uh, different tools. So uh, that was, and they even had podcasts. I remember uh, during the COVID, uh, we were taping podcasts and so on and so forth. So they were very, very proactive. And I do think that, yes, there was a resistance, but um, that the it came also with a um, uh, a com um, the that for them to see the compliance, there are two different ways. There's a health sheet, a flock health sheet that is being sent to the uh, abattoir by the producer when they're shipping their uh, birds to slaughter. And in that fact sheet or that flock health sheet, they have to report the various vaccines that birds have been administered, but also the drugs, dosage, reason, mortality. So then once the um, abattoir receives the information, they know if they have had a sick or a healthy flock, but the CFIE can see if there was a car use of antimicrobials. And by law, they have to write the, write the proper um, um, information. Also, the um, the there's a, a surveillance on what is being used and uh, this is uh, and then the there are fines also if the producer is not um, um, basically uh, complying to these new regulations but it's all uh, within the producers association thank you and uh, Yusuf Ibrahim is asking in about your experience uh, on the effectiveness of bacterial vaccines against diseases uh, such as the colibacillosis, for instance. Yes, the, um, uh, we have uh, just finished writing a chapter in vaccinology for the upcoming avian disease uh, journal. And we have written, my grad student and myself, a. Uh, paper entitled Bacterial Vaccines from Pasture to Genomics. So uh, what I can say is that um, we now have the tools, the genomic tools to develop vaccines which will be more effective. We can crack the sequence, the genomic sequence of our bacteria. We can compare by reverse vaccinology, we can compare uh, commensal and pathogenic strains with the proper tools also. We need to, to uh, make sure that we can um, uh, differentiate both commensal and pathogenic strains properly. Uh, but then we can see what are the genes of virulence that are most common. And this is, and from there we'll be able to uh, basically design better uh, bacterial vaccines. And I think they, these will be very important in key to raising birds without antibiotics or with less antibiotics. Regarding colibacillosis, um, there uh, is an, what we call arrow deleted uh, E. coli vaccine. 
And we see it working very well, see it working with different efficacy. I guess it probably depends on the E. coli strains you have on your farm. Again, um, bacteria such as E. coli and Torococcus uh, sicorum have a high level of uh, plasticity, if I can say that, multiple genes of virulence for E. coli. Uh, but not a single one that is present in all of the all of the E. coli. So this is why it becomes it still is a tricky one. But it does reduce when used in, for example, laying hands and broiler breeders. It has shown to reduce the use of antimicrobial, for example, the mortality and the severity of the clinical signs related to colibacillosis. So I have um, great hope uh, with our genomic tools to come up with new bacterial vaccines um, that will be very effective. There's, um, for example, and some of them will be recombinant, like there's a, a new salmonella vaccine that is a triple sugar deleted salmonella vaccine. It means that that bacteria, when given into the host, cannot survive because it needs tree sugar that are available easily in uh, vitro uh, when provided the, those sugar, but it won't survive very well in, in the, the host. And what they've done is that they have added to the bacteria that triple sugar deleted salmonella, they have added a plasmid that does carry genes of virulence. In that case, they added a, a gene of virulence, NetB, uh, for necrotic enteritis. But since we also have NetB negative strains then uh, that are um, present in the field, it doesn't have necessarily the best, uh, uh, it's not 100% protective, but it does protect against the net B positive costume preferential strains that are out there. So as I was mentioning, it is important to know our enemy to better fight it. And we, this is why we know to, uh, we need to understand the various uh, genes of virulence that are important as well as the risk factors. Thank you very much, Martin. And I think with this, we can really conclude on how important it is to have a combination of scientific information, technological tools and advances, but also the right policy and legislation in place and the good collaboration, sharing information with private sectors, communication with the farmers. And so having all these elements in place, but then the good news is by having all of those together, we can reduce the use of antimicrobials and eventually we can reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance. So I think it's very awful um, a message that is coming from your, your experience and your sharing of information that I think it would be a good take on message of, uh, for everybody. There is a lot we can do and we can have good results. So with this, I would like to thank you again. It has been a wonderful, uh, share of information and the availability in addressing all these questions and being with you in this hour. And of course, I would like to thank all of the participants coming from attending from uh, such a diverse number of countries from Philippines and Australia and Russia uh, to, to, to Colombia and Canada and uh, passing by, you know, going through uh, Senegal and South Africa and Spain, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, Greece, really a very a wealth of different geographical things in Madagascar. I mean, really, really many of you. So thanks again for being with us. Thanks to Martina Tavlaro working behind the scene just to make sure that everything has gone smoothly. And now I would like to leave you with some information of what is forthcoming in the future. So thanks, Martina. If Marina, you can put up the last slides. Yeah, so just... Uh, uh, keep on uh, being uh, uh, informed about what's coming up. The next presentation uh, will be on 26th of September. As I was saying, now we're doubling the, the number. We are going to hear quite different uh, perspective. So by Jonathan Rushton, Rushton, professor at the University of Liverpool in UK. We are going to look at uh, how to, to, yeah, to, to address the economic burden of uh, antimicrobial use and resistance in livestock using a very specific tool, which is the Global Burden of Animal Disease Program. So again, a different angle, very interesting. Uh, this time we're going to have earlier in the morning for the you know European uh, Central European time, 9:30, 10:30, to make it easier for the Americans uh, for the Asian colleagues to follow. 
And then from January onward, we are going to have uh, webinars earlier in the morning for us European and later in the afternoon. So we will better address uh, the need of uh, um, the, the, the participants attending in America and in Asia, not to being too cumbersome for them. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please remember, we will share with you the, um, the presentation and the recording and the interesting information which has been shared. Please don't forget to give us your feedback through the question that I think it's uh, online and uh, yeah, in the chat box. It's very important for us. And if you're interested in sharing with us the results of your research, information and so on, we're always very happy to hear from you. Contact us to uh, the address which is on the slide. And again, thanks to everybody and looking forward to be with you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you and goodbye and have a nice day.